Hello and welcome to another episode of the Space Update. Coming up this week, uh, we're going to be talking updates on International Space Station, Starship, and a lot of other space news. I'm your host Ryan, and joining me today is I'm another space nut, and thanks for checking us out today, guys. Thanks for joining us. It's just a two-man show this week, M- myself and Space Nut. Busy week this week with Starship and everything, but uh, let's get started with Transporter One. Quite a landmark launch, this one. Uh, 143 satellites or small CubeSats on one single launch of a Falcon 9. Absolutely incredible when you think, uh, I don't know, last record, I think, our, uh, Space Nut was, um, was it Starlink with the last biggest launch, probably with 60 satellites on there? Uh, I think ISRO had the title prior to SpaceX. Yeah, I think yeah, they if had I'm a not quite mistaken, it was 114 ish satellites. Yeah, yeah, so SpaceX beat them by a, a good mile. Um, but uh, the loads of different uh, satellites on there. And more interestingly, there was 10 Starlink satellites going into a polar orbit there, so a slightly different uh, uh, orbit there and everything. Plus, uh, we've had uh, guys who we've got coming on the show very soon, Dawn Aerospace. They had a few propulsion systems on board, some satellites on there, so we'll be able to uh, have a good chat with them and everything about... Uh, what their involvement on this launch and everything that's, that's uh, absolutely awesome. Plus the uh, another really good landing from the Falcon Nine. I agree, and some we also have the first generation of Starlink satellites heading to a polar orbit with laser communications on board. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's countless of. I think there's some DARPA satellites on there. And a lot of startup companies uh, trial and bits on there and everything. But launches like this, we'll probably see a lot more of because it brings the cost down for all these small small companies wanting to get into the aerospace business at the end of the day. I didn't quite find the exact cost per launch if they carried on doing these kind of group launches, if you like. But uh, I'll post it out there as soon as I find the information. Um, but those sta- Starlink satellites quite interesting. They're doing the polar orbit and everything. And uh, we also saw upgrades coming to uh, Starlink as well. Um, a bit of a tip for tat going on between Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon on Twitter and everything from what we've seen. Um, Elon stating that uh, Starlink's pretty, almost ready to go barring a few more launches, a few more Starlink satellites, but Amazon trying to book out certain orbits for their satellites, but Elon State and Amazon are still a good seven years away before they even attempt to get anywhere near what uh, SpaceX are with Starlink. Yeah, I mean, it's important to realise that every transport mission is a Starlink mission also. You know, these are ride-share missions. They've got a primary payload and they've got a secondary payload. And with it being in-house uh, reusability, it just dramatically drops. I think it might cause disruption in the small launcher industry. Yeah, because I mean, launching that many satellites in one go, it create, creates almost creates like a super super cluster of uh, satellites in a concentrated area until they're, they're spread out and everything like that. Because I saw a few guys uh, tracking it um, on the systems that are available online, and could literally see it was just like a swarm of bees just orbiting the the Earth for a good. A good few hours before they slowly, well, over the few next few weeks, they're going to slowly dissipate, to spread themselves apart, and everything like that with their own propulsion systems and everything. But um, like you say, it will cause a, a bit of uh, issues because obviously we've seen mentioned. Uh, I think it was Rocket Lab uh, Peter Beck mentioning it's like when you launch a rocket in the future, possibly it's going to be like threading a threading a needle through a, a little net of Starlink satellites, and then you got. Uh, you got one web, then you've got all these stuff that Amazon want to eventually do, similar to Starlink. So it's just going to be a, a net of different satellites, and it's just going to be an absolute pain to launch a rocket in the future. Never mind to uh, try and land uh, a Starship. Through all that space debris from previous launches and previous hardware on orbit that's failed or hasn't deorbited yet, it, you know, it does cause, as you're saying, you know, pot- potential flight disruption, the flight paths, it might lock parts of the glove off. Yeah, yeah. And um, just moving on from the upgrades from Starlink as well, uh, the International Space Station, just to uh, my left or right there, whichever way it is for you guys there, um, the solar panels that you see there, they're actually upgrading those. So it uh, produces around I think it's about 215 kilowatts of power or something like that at the moment. But once it's uh, get the upgrades, it'll be about 100 and an extra 160 kilowatts or something like that, an extra a hell of a lot more power in general. Um, just double check the figures there. Yeah, the overall power system will generate 215 kilowatts of power compared to the 116 kilowatts 
the existing arrays provide. So quite a lot more power to uh, power a lot more systems and everything they're installing on there. So that's one of the upgrades and obviously I pinged out a message to NASA because uh, obviously if you use the hashtag Ask NASA over on Twitter, give it a, a few days or so, they will answer your questions sometimes. Um, I did done a live stream the other day and they uh, actually answered answer, answer my question. The, uh, the, the, the I think it was Kenny Dodd who answered our question. Um, just said, um, if you had the opportunity to upgrade anything you'd like on the International Space Station, what would it be? And he went on to mention the solar arrays that are getting upgraded and everything's absolutely critical to the extension of uh, the International Space Station. Because obviously the plan was to decommission it in the coming years, but with the upgrade of the solar panels and everything, they can hopefully extend it for another 10 to 15 years, or possibly even more. And plus, when it, they hand over, uh, when they do hand it over, it'll have a good, decent uh, solar panels on there. And the existing ones that are on there, they're not actually going to take those off. They're just going to install the other ones in addition alongside those. So it will look a little bit different to that picture there once you get those extra solar panels installed and everything. Um, as to yet, I'm not sure when those are getting installed just yet. I don't, did you see that posted anywhere, Aaron, about when they're going to install those? Um, I haven't seen an install date, if I'm not mistaken. It's due for launch Q4 of this year. Yeah, yeah potentially end of this, this year, I think, at some point and everything. But um, as well as that, um, Kenny, Kenny Todd also hinted on, his, on a personal note the thing I'd like to see more is a lot more ports on the International Space Station. Obviously, we've seen that uh, NanoRacks uh, Bishop Airlock installed. But I think that's more for the, uh, the walks around the space station when they're doing repairs and installation. Um, as for ports for docking and everything, I think I believe NASA want to put a few more on there. So well, we did see an international docking adapter added to the ISS last year, though. So they are slowly upgrading it, and things like the Axiom space station that's going to tag along, it sort of it starts to make sense when you look at the upgrades the ISS is getting in terms of its power generation from the new solar cells that could support an entire second space station. And, yeah. You know, yeah. The the Axiom module being privately built might even think about um, reorbiting propulsion so that uh, the ISS isn't so dependent on spacecraft as well. And these kind of things become available with more power. Yeah, because I think at some one point there was, I think just a few months ago, there was two of the Dragon modules, one one cargo, one crew, and I believe there was a Soyuz uh, craft there as well. And I don't know if there was there was the one of the Cygnus cargoes also attached there at one point as well. So it's like four or five vehicles, or four or five ports, if you like, taken. Um, and obviously, they want to try and up up the ante and do more experiments up in space and ramp it up because there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment here on the ground. But we need to get it up into space and do those experiments and everything. So little hints from NASA that they're look, maybe looking to uh, increase the amount of ports on the International Space Station or even make it ever so slightly bigger because it is like a almost like a big mechano set. You could just bolt on another system within reason to the end at the end of space station. And it's it's important about um just how how much science is going up there to the ISS. You were saying there about the struggle with ports. You know, things like the Artemis Accords moving forward are only going to bring more countries that are looking towards going into space to the International Space Station because it is owned by everybody. And, you know, as, as we see Israel make it to orbit with human space flight and we see other private companies making human-rated craft, it does open the International Space Station up and it does, you know, bring, bring that potential for um, the need for a lot more adapters and a lot more space on board as well. Yeah, because uh, we'll soon need a bit more room for another aircraft that's uh, hopefully launching in March 25th at Starliner. Fingers crossed for that one. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so hopefully that one will launch. Um, apparently they've uh, tested out the software and hardware and everything that's supposedly approved and those 60 plus errors have all been rectified by, by approval from NASA and the FAA and everyone. So hopefully no glitches of any sort kind soon. And the craft is uh, being prepared for its launch on the March of 25th. So really promising. As, as many glitches as Boeing has had with, over the years with everything, not just the spacecraft, um, it'd be nice to see them finally get to the interstation because it's all about increasing the access to space in general, really. We can't just rely on SpaceX because we've only got so many 
vehicles. Yes, they've got lots of boosters and everything like that. And they might have two or three crew, crew capsules um, in the next few months or so, but we need more than two or three. We need 20, 100, however many more, because we want to go to the moon, the Mar- to Mars and everything. We'll need an awful lot more. And open up the next frontier, leaving the well. It's important in the next step in our history, in our timeline. You know, like since the 30s and 40s, people have been fantasising and dreaming about what it'd be like to leave the well and, and go out into space and start to, you know, explore the the opportunities that other planets bring. Think about in situ resource production and the need to maintain that infrastructure. You're going to need people to maintain that infrastructure in turn. They're going to need to be fairly close on hand. You can just launch them every time. And this does start to branch out as, you know, the, the next generation and it all spans from uh, going going to space and learning science now on the International Space Station. Yeah, yeah. And um, we're eventually going to see the Excel version of the dragon module aren't we um i'm probably assuming spacex are on with it at some capacity at the moment because that won't be too far away it will be within reason just to make a a larger version of the crew module or the cargo module and believe in the next month or so we might see another falcon heavy launch so whether it's that the xl cargo one we're going a falcon heavy i don't know what the capability of it will be due to the extra weight, but but then when you compare the weight of the cargo and crew module compared to 60 Starlink satellites, the, the weight might not be too much difference, really. And we get to see the mighty Falcon Heavy rise again. Absolutely incredible, that. The two, the those two boosters, when they came down, like that, seeing them land for the first time like that was just absolutely mind-blowing. Think incredible. about how good SpaceX have got at utilising drone ships. Uh, yeah, and they've got um, the two uh, oil rigs now that are finally converting and everything. So for the Starship and Super Heavy booster, but obviously it'd be a while off that one. I expect nothing to be seen from that until probably the end of the year, at least, or probably quite possibly middle, middle of next year, because those oil rigs are huge and we'll need a hell of a lot stripping out of them, cleaning down, rewiring and everything, because... I imagine the wiring's completely out di- outdated and everything on the, on that thing. And if you want to get some nice close-up um, footage of that, I recommend checking out RGV aerial photography because there's a lot of pictures on Twitter of it from the side. But looking at it from above, it really starts to make sense just how big these are and how much they are going to assist the Starship operations for space. And it does, it does quite often does like not necessarily live videos, but it's uh, it posts the videos from when he takes off from the airport traveling there and then flying around which is quite interest, interesting as well so you can almost fly fly along with him and see what he's seeing within reason can't you yeah he does um quite often do those live as well if you can check them out it's definitely worth subscribing for notifications on there because he does occasionally do live streams that you know on, re- on request sometimes maruccio uh, can sometimes get some really nice footage um, yeah yeah and so. just very recently um today as we're recording right now on uh what is it? Tuesday the 26th. Um, SpaceX have announced that uh, they're possibly doing the flight on Thursday later in the week. And today they've just done the test of the 7.2 test tank of some sort. I don't know how, how well that test went because it literally happened right now as we're recording. But um, seems reasonably good. They've uh, just letting it settle down now. So they've done probably the initial pressure test and they're probably going to push it again probably later in the week, probably after... SN9's flight, possibly, and I imagine it's probably using that uh, better 304L steel, I think it is. The mystery 3 millimetre thick stainless steel that SpaceX have been talking about. Yeah, it's just insane, isn't it? Three, I think 3 millimetres of steel, it doesn't sound much, but uh, strengthen it up and everything. The only the only worry, my worry with that is uh, the orbital re-entry, the pressure of that on the underside, with those, the heat shields and everything. I imagine with it being a curved body, it would be all right, but the amount of pressure, whether that stain, thin stainless steel will buckle under the pressure is somewhere, whether it be on the flaps on the main body, it would be uh, interesting to see how much it survives. I mean, when we're talking about three millimetre stainless steel, 
looking at SpaceX prior to this have been using a 4mm stainless steel. So it's about a 25% reduction in the overall mass of the Starship. So, you know, when, when you think oh, it's, it's only a millimetre, like, there's a very good reason to lose a millimetre in the stainless steel. Yeah, it saves a lot of weight and the less weight you have, the more power you use, the less fuel you use and everything just improves efficient, efficiency all around. Um, but... With Starship, just sticking with Starship for a bit longer, um, I'm interested to see once they get a lot of these test flights over how they adapt the Starship for cargo and everything. Because we have all those header tanks and fuel lines running up through the tip of the rocket and everything like that. Plus, we're going to have to shift all that out of the way to create the payload area, essentially. So that'll be interesting to see how they eventually move or adjust the header tank to work to fit that 100 metric tons of payload in the nose yeah i'd agree and i mean it also ultimately the payload uh that elon's targeting and spacex are targeting is humans we consume a lot of volume as as human beings you know we we need the space in ahead of the vehicle to facilitate human needs and human survival for the trip to mars and it is it's 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 a mystery where they're going to put the header tank or how the header tank in itself will evolve over time if they maybe try different systems out that are smaller or yeah, located yeah. in different places. It just is. Yeah. In this SN9 vehicle, they've uh, upgraded the header tank um, with the, all the, it was helium, is it helium, I believe, and everything just to do the pre- better pressurization on it and everything like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exciting. But- He's good going forward. I think I'm a little bit upset with the weather in Texas at present because it's causing a lot of speculation. But then at the same time, I understand the safety concerns of, say, launching in fog or in high winds. And so it's just about... And hopefully not a load of fog like there was earlier on because I, I tuned in in the afternoon. It was just literally white screen of fog. And uh, if that happens on Thursday, you're not going to see the Starship at all. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they could probably launch and land it because it's all automated, but uh, we won't get a very good view of it. I think you'll get a nice picture of the uh, engine roaring through the fog, but not much else. A lot of special lighting effects off the fog and everything. But uh, I think we'll just wrap it, wrap it up there. Just a quick and uh, short and quick and snappy news updates this week. Not too much going on. A hand, handful of launches and a few updates from Starship and everything. Um, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ping us over on over on Twitter. Uh, I'm up there on the space update. Uh, another space nuts up there himself and everything. And we've also got at Total Space Net. Um, we're also posting up there. So any questions, just fire us questions on uh, Twitter and everything. But uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'm Ryan from the Space Update. Thanks for joining us. I'm under the Space Nut, and uh, once again, thank you for joining us, guys. There is now the Space Update merchandise going live over the coming days, and follow Ryan, the Space Update, on Twitter. He will be releasing promo codes to coincide with the release of the Space Update merchandise. And a big thank you to all our Patreon supporters, uh, Warhawk, Angry Astronaut, Howard Walker, Sammy Oscar Rowe, What About It, Jason Sebastian, slash to the future. Um, Gaio Paglari, Fram Rick, Susie, and Marco, who's uh, listening in, and Susie. And um, thank you guys for all your support. If you want to support supporters like these guys, head over to patreon.com forward slash total space. And where else can they find us, Aaron? I, th- I believe we are at Total Space Network on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, we're also on Instagram now. So if uh, you want to follow us over on there, uh, we just set that one up. So if you want to follow us over there. Also, if uh, any of you guys want to follow us over on LinkedIn, uh, you can find us on there, Total Space Network. And um, for all of you, all the professionals out there, I'm on there. You can see all my uh, work background here now and in the past and everything. And as with uh, the Space Nut and all the other hosts there. So find us on LinkedIn all your social media platforms and everything. Thanks for joining us again, guys.